continue our discussion with the endocrine system. Let's talk about how hormone secretion is regulated. Obviously, something must know when to release these hormones, because if you got an imbalance of homeostasis with one or more of these hormones, you could have some very big problems. But as always, homeostasis is maintained by two mechanisms, negative and positive feedback. You should have seen these before. Remember, negative feedback is when the body goes against a deviation. And remember, almost all feedback mechanisms are of that type. It's not very often that you would want a deviation from what's normal, and that's what positive feedback is. So most of the time in the body, if you get too little or too much of a hormone, negative feedback will adjust it. If it gets too high, brings it down. If it gets too low, brings it back up. But again, there are some times when the body wants a deviation with hormones. A good example of that is oxytocin. You may have heard of oxytocin before, and one of its functions is to cause labor contractions of the toed muscle of the uterus. As a baby grows inside of the uterus, which is basically a hollow muscular container, the baby grows bigger and stretches the muscle around it. As that muscle stretches, it will tell the pituitary gland to release more of that oxytocin. So the levels of that hormone keep rising higher and higher. That's definitely a deviation away from what's normal. So that's some positive feedback. But positive will only go on for so long. Eventually, negative will shut it off. When enough of that oxytocin is released, that smooth muscle of the uterus will contract. The baby will be expelled. And when the baby's no longer stretching the uterus, that chemical's no longer released. And of course, their levels will come right back down to something that's normal. Negative will shut it off there. But again, most all mechanisms are negative. You've probably already seen that. Looking at hormone secretion, it's regulated in three different ways. Now, the first one you see here is by the action of a substance other than a hormone. A great example of that is good old sugar that you consume. Think about your blood sugar, glucose. It is what regulates insulin levels, right? That's a hormone from your pancreas. So think about if you eat a meal, your blood sugar levels will rise, and that's when the body releases insulin. As the cells take the sugar in, blood sugar will drop, and then insulin secretion slows. Whatever the sugar does, the insulin does. So that's a substance other than a hormone regulating the release of a hormone. Nervous system can definitely do it. Think about if something scares you, how you rapidly have the neurons in the sympathetic nervous system releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine. They can release those chemicals very quickly, but the point being, neurons, nervous system, are controlling the release of that chemical. Number three, you can also see another hormone doing it. We go over all of our hormones in other videos. You're going to see that a lot of these hormones just regulate the release of another hormone. That's what tropic hormones are. One example of that is thyroid stimulating hormone. We'll see this one from the pituitary. That chemical targets the thyroid gland and tells it when to release some of its hormones. There's our three different ways in which you see this hormone release being regulated. The same thing is right here, just typed up for you to read over. How do hormone secretion rates change? When you have a hormone being released, you'll see they don't all follow the same pattern. But one of these is what's called a chronic pattern. When you hear chronic, think constant. There's hardly any change over any small unit of time. Good example of this is thyroid hormone. Remember this thyroid hormone, we'll talk about more in another video, largely regulates your metabolism, how much energy you have. You can't change your thyroid hormone levels over the short term. You have to get active for a long period of time. And as you put increased energy demands on your body, slowly that level will rise up. But point being, it's not going to change over the short term. So chronic's very constant. Hardly any change is seen. Acute sort of the opposite. Here's where you see very rapid changes. Think about if something scares you. Neurons in the sympathetic nervous system very rapidly release epinephrine and norepinephrine. Those chemical levels will rise up very fast, but they'll come back down very quickly too. Hormones might also follow a cyclic pattern, meaning in regular cycles. And female reproductive hormones like estrogen and progesterone are good examples of that. So if you look at a little drawing of each, notice the chronic, very constant. Hardly any change at all is going to be seen. 
with the acute levels go way up very fast but they come down very fast but they might also follow some very regular cycles so there's pictures with each one of those three looking at those hormone release patterns again again the thyroid follows that chronic again very constant levels right there epinephrine and norepinephrine definitely go with the acute you see rapid changes then again things like estrogen follow those regular cycles looking at comparison of hormones in different ways if you look at these hormones remember they're floating around in the watery part of the blood that we call the plasma some of them will bind to plasma proteins and some of them will not those that bind to a plasma protein makes a larger molecule larger molecules don't diffuse as rapidly as what smaller ones do you've had a discussion on diffusion in a previous chapter that was something they talked about with diffusion so those that bind diffuse slower they tend to stay in the body longer larger molecules are more difficult for the liver and kidneys to get rid of that will be in future chapters too so these tend to follow more of that chronic pattern but you look at those unbound ones and if they don't bind to a plasma protein that makes for a smaller molecule they tend to diffuse faster and work faster they go a little bit more with that acute pattern there something else you'll see with hormone comparisons there's many ways to put them in different categories but water versus lipid soluble is one remember when you look at a cell membrane it's roughly half lipid right? it's a big component of that cell membrane lipids and lipids will mix so if a lipid based chemical signal reaches a cell it'll diffuse through the cell membrane again the two lipids mixed together goes through that layer and often they go straight to the DNA and usually initiate DNA synthesis when it comes to water-based molecules they can't get through the lipid cell membrane layer everybody knows oil and water doesn't mix so the water-based chemical signals tend to work on the outside of the cell and usually what they do is open up an ion channel but either one of these two chemicals could activate an enzyme inside of the cell We'll see examples of that as we go through the particular hormones in future videos. But there's the three different ways a hormone can work when it gets to its target tissue, whatever that may be. Again, the water soluble can't get into the cell. So they tend to bind to the ion channel gates on the outside, usually opening them up. Again, those that are lipid based go through the cell membrane, usually to the DNA, and tell the cell to make a protein but either one of them could activate an enzyme. Something else you hear with hormones is a process of up and down regulation. Down regulation is where you see fewer receptor sites for a hormone after exposure. And that'll give you a decrease in hormone sensitivity. That's what happens with most of these chemical signals. But sometimes you'll get up regulation where you see more sensory receptors for a chemical signal. That usually happens where two hormones are working together. One hormone usually makes a cell more sensitive to another one. We'll see examples of that in future chapters too. Then they also mention the half-life, how long it takes the body to eliminate half a dose of a substance. Kidneys largely do this. Liver may work right along with it there, but you'll see that in future chapters like on the kidneys. We'll look at another video. The kidneys get rid of these hormones makes sense if you think about how do you know if somebody has a chemical in their body often your analysis is done the urine is material taken from the plasma of the blood so if these hormones are floating in that watery plasma part it makes sense the kidneys could get rid of them so just how long it takes your body to get rid of half a dose of a substance is half life cascade effect explains how the cells can use multiple enzymes to get a very large effect out of just a little bit of hormone just a little bit of hormone often goes a long way it may activate one enzyme inside of a cell then that enzyme may activate others and you end up with a very big effect Remember, enzymes speed up chemical reactions inside of cells so they can make things occur a whole lot faster so there's your little discussion on the water versus the lipid soluble. You can read over that section right there. And again, if you'd like to look at my books with lots more information and study questions, they're available on Amazon, there's part one and part two. And notice again, the systems that each one covers because they are different.